Hey STAT students, welcome to another video. Welcome to another linear regression video. This is going to be our final video on linear regression, so, well, sorry. Uh, this one is about linear regression, what to do when things don't go as planned. Because sometimes things kind of go wrong and they don't turn out like you thought they would go. Uh, yeah, so, uh, um, anyway. Uh, first off, let's look at some things that we already know, okay? Uh, for example, if you have bivariate data, two quantitative variables, uh, you can make a scatter plot, okay? You can also figure out your least squared regression line, uh, which is y hat equals b naught plus b one x, b naught being the y-intercept, b one being the slope. Uh, that line goes through the point x bar, y bar, that is the mean of your x data and the mean of your y data right around there. Uh, <clears throat> what else do you know? Oh, if you know your correlation coefficient and the, the uh, standard deviation of your uh, response and explanatory variables, you can calculate your slope. Uh, we also know that if we look at the scatter plot and check out the residuals, we can see if the linear model is appropriate. That is to say, there's no pattern in the residuals at all, okay? And that's going to be a lot of what we're uh, talking about later on in this video. So, <clears throat> what else do we know? Let's talk about the correlation coefficient for a second. Correlation coefficient is the average of the product of z-scores of all data points. Uh, basically, what you need to know is it has to do with the z-scores, okay? Uh, and what you, the other thing you need to know is it doesn't change if you rescale your data. It also doesn't change if you switch your explanatory and your response variables, okay? Also, please remember that r is always between negative 1 and 1, okay? R squared, the coefficient of ter determination. Uh, one way to calculate it is just by taking R and squaring it, okay? Another way of calcul calculating it is to take the variance of your residuals, divide it by the variance of your response variable, subtract that fraction from one, and that'll get you R squared. Now let's look for a second at what that actually means. Okay, your Y data, your response variable, it has a variance. It's a measurement of how spread out it is. I'm, well, I should be doing it like this, okay? How spread out it is, how, how unpredictable it is, okay? You do your linear regression. Then you find the residuals. So basically, you've, you've, uh, uh, you've made the errors, you've made the, the variation a lot smaller by, uh, uh, by, by, doing this, this, by doing this linear regression, okay? So you look at the variance of your residuals in comparison to the variance of your response variable that you started off with. This is always smaller than this is. And the smaller this is, then the more linear your data are, okay? And so if this is like, if, if you have no residuals, if your data points completely line up in a, a straight line, this is gonna be zero, and R squared is gonna be one minus zero, so one. If this is pretty much the same thing as this, if doing linear regression didn't help much at all, then uh, this is going to be near 1, and 1 minus that is going to be near 0. So R squared ends up telling you it's between 0 and 1, and it ends up being a really good gauge of how, uh, uh, how, good the, how strong the correlation is. As a matter of fact, the uh, rule of thumb that I usually use is I just cut this interval into thirds. The first third, I consider that a weak correlation. Middle third is moderate. Top third is strong. Okay? People have their various different definitions of weak, moderate, and strong. I think this is a not too bad one. Okay? Now, <clears throat> let's talk about outliers. So here we have some data. Uh, these are some used cars. Uh, I, uh, um, I was looking around for uh, used car prices, and I got, uh, this is the age on my x-axis in years, and this is the uh, thousands of dollars. Okay? So we're all the way from just a little over $1,000 up to over $20,000, and the age goes from uh, one year up to more than 20 years here, okay? So, what I notice when I look at these data points, uh, I notice that I get this nice, it's definitely a negative association, which is what you would expect. Cars get older, they're worth less. Uh, and uh, this is this nice little pattern going on here. There's three points that are kind of bugging me, though. This guy here, and these two over here. So what do you do? What do you do when you get these points that are kind of 
misbehaving. They're not following the pattern. Well, one thing you do is you find out why. Go look at them and see what's going on here. Well, I did that. And so I went over and I saw, well, these are both, that's a, uh, I can't remember which one is which, but one's a Mercedes and one's a BMW, and they're both sports cars. Well, those things cost a lot, okay? The rest of these guys down here, these are Chevys and Fords and Toyotas and Hondas and Hyundais, or Hondas and Hyundais. Uh, anyway, they're not Mercedes and BMWs, and so they're not nearly as expensive as those are. Uh, so, it depends on what I'm doing in the future. If I'm trying to, if I'm not expecting to get any more sports cars, I might just decide to throw them out, because I might just decide, well, that, that doesn't really apply. That's from a different population. I'm not looking at that population. So, I'll just say goodbye to one of them, and I'll say goodbye to the other one, okay? Now let me undo that for a second, let me bring it back, because when you do that, you need to look at what happens to your line, okay? Now notice, I lose the first one, the line goes down a little bit, I lose the second one, the line goes down a little bit. The slope didn't change very much at all. The lines moved down, which makes sense, because these things, up, they were pulling the line up there, but you'll notice the slope didn't really change very much. And then there's this little fellow over there. Well, I went and looked at that one too. And as it turns out, that's, uh, that car has just lasted a long time, okay? It's a Toyota, it's uh, uh, over 20 years, 20 years old, but it hasn't been driven that much. So even though it's very, very cheap, it's still not really fitting in with our data. So I might decide, well, I don't expect to see cars that old, so I'll throw that out and, oh, now the slope on my line really changed quite a bit when I lost that one. Okay? This is known as an influential point. Okay? It's an influential point because it had a lot of influence on the line once I lost it. Okay? The slope really, really changed. The other points, they might have had a change, they might have had an influence on uh, uh, the, uh, um, uh, the y-intercept. They definitely had an influence on r-squared. When we lost those points, let me go back. Oops, I'm going the wrong way. Uh, okay, there we go. All right. Right now, my R squared is 34%. When I lose the Mercedes, my R squared goes up to 50%. When I lose the BMW, my R squared goes up to 75%. So I've gone from moderately weak to strong correlation uh, by losing those two points that I decided really weren't appropriate anyway. Okay? Then when I lose this one, my slope changes quite a bit and R squared goes up to 90. So now I've got a very, very strong correlation. Now, Word of warning, however, don't just throw out the outliers because they don't fit the rest of your data. That's cheating, okay? You have the data that you got, okay? So you can't just throw it out because it's ugly, all right? That's, that's not how the world works. I threw these guys out because I'm not expecting to see any more German sports cars. I'm not sure throwing out this other one was a good idea. So. I would actually probably leave that one in and then just have to deal with the strange data set that I have. And dealing with that strange data set, we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Uh, but then the other thing you do when you have weird points like that is you, th you throw them out and you rerun your regression and you see how much did things change. Maybe they didn't change that much. So maybe having that extra point in there, you can either, when you publish your results, you can publish it with the outlier, without the outlier and show, look, either way I can make my point. Okay? And that's really, remember, we're using this data to probably bolster an argument. We're making a point. And if we can make the point either with, with that extra data point or without it, good. Okay. Now let's look at another one. Here we have a literacy rate and birth rate per 1,000 for uh, various nations around the world. And uh, what you'll see is you have a, uh, you have a linear association here, which... I would expect to see as my literacy rate gets higher, I would expect my population to be more educated. In particular, I would expect the female population to be more educated. And the more educated my female population is, the, uh, uh, the more my birth rate is going to go down. Okay? That's, that's I, I would expect to see that. So, uh, now again, I got this one over here. Here's a country that has a fairly high birth rate, not the highest birth rate, but a fairly high birth rate but a very low literacy rate. And it's really changing my results. 
So again, I would want to go in there and I would want to look at it and I would want to say, is there something about this country that is different from the others? Maybe it's in a different part of the world that's not, you know, maybe I ought to treat these populations differently. But uh, whatever the case, if I decided that it's a good idea to throw this data point out, you'll notice that the line changes dramatically. And now there's a much more pronounced correlation. There's a, a well, R squared went from 52% to 62%, which is, you know, pretty decent growth there. Uh, but also, I noticed that my slope changed quite a bit. So now there's a, uh, um, uh, a much more pronounced um, uh, relationship between uh, your literacy rate and the birth rate. Uh, so, to summarize these uh, weirdo points, points that are way off to the left or right, so that they're so basically they're outliers for your explanatory data. Those are known to have high leverage, okay? And if they have large residuals, and if they're if they're off the line, they're known as influential points. So here's here's a point right here, for example, that is a high leverage point. It's on my line but it's way out here, away from everything else. That's definitely a high leverage point. It's a high leverage point because if I wiggled it, my line would move like crazy, okay? I can basically move the line just by moving this point, okay? But it's not, a, it's not an influential point because if I were to remove it, the line really wouldn't change that much. Here we have the exact same data down here, except now this point has been moved, and you'll notice that the line really did shift quite a bit. Now, if I were to take that point away, the line would go doing, back to where it was before. It would change quite a bit, meaning this point has a lot of influence on the slope of the line. Okay? So that's an influential point. That's a high leverage point. Uh, by the way, if I were to remove this, what would change quite a bit is R squared. Right now, R squared is 61%. And if I were to take this away, it would be considerably lower. For example, in this graph, R squared is 25%. And the only thing that's different is this one data point. Okay. Uh, points that are outliers but are not far out to the left or right are not considered to be high leverage points. This is like our Mercedes or our BMW, our BMW that we saw earlier. Uh, and it's also like this guy right here. Okay? Uh, if I were to remove this point, it wouldn't change the line much. Okay? It, wouldn't it certainly wouldn't change the slope of the line very much. What it would change is it would change R squared. And R squared would definitely be higher if I were to remove this because a lot of our spread has gone away and our points are much closer to the line now. Okay? Uh, so, one more thing that can go wrong, and that is if you have data that are summaries of other data, then you got yourself a problem. Okay? Let's look at a couple of uh, scatter plots here. This is a scatter plot that we've seen before a couple of videos ago when we were first talking about correlation. Uh, these are SAT scores. We were predicting the math SAT using the verbal SAT. So here I have my verbal SAT on the explanatory axis and my math SAT on the response axis. And here's my line that I'm using to, uh, to explain. And my R squared is 0.47, which is a moderate, uh, uh, um, uh, it's a moderate correlation. And I might look at that and I might decide, you know, this is just these are too many points. Let me, uh, let me summarize this. I'll take all my 400s and I'll just average them. And I'll take all my 420s and I'll average them. I'll take all my 500s and average them. I'll take my 580s and I'll average those. I'll take my 650s and I'll average those. And I'll just, I'll use the averages instead. And this is what I would get instead. All right, this is a lie. Don't do this, okay? Don't summarize. Why? Because this isn't the real data here. That's your data set. That gives you the true uh, picture of how spread out it is. This, well, these are summaries. Of course the summaries aren't going to be as spread out. Okay? So this looks way neater than that. But it's not. So the, 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 the fast model is, I mean, the, the, the fast message is don't summarize. Okay? Uh, what else uh, do you not do? Extrapolate. Okay? Extrapolation is, well, here we have uh, data of uh, twin births. So this is the number of twin births in the U.S. from the years, it looks like, 81 to 2005. 
And you'll see that uh, the number of twin births were growing here. And then around 1990, it kind of leveled off and it didn't grow much at all. And then around 1995, it just took off. And we've been, more and more twins have been uh, being born every year. Uh, actually, I don't know if that's still the case now, but it was in the, uh, in the late 90s and early 2000s. Okay, what is extrapolation? Extrapolation would be using this chart right now to see, to guess how many births we're going to have in the year 2013. Okay, what's wrong with that? Well, you can see what's wrong with it. It's because for a while you had this trend going on, and then you had this pattern, and then you had this pattern. You don't know if this is going to change or not. Maybe it will, maybe it won't. Data can be linear for a while, but not necessarily forever. Matter of fact, uh, I might take this and say, well, let me just go back and find out that in uh, the year 1800, we had negative 30,000 twins being born. That doesn't make any sense, okay? So it's just not a good idea to extrapolate to, and what extrapolate means, again, is to uh, go outside of the range of your data and try to make a prediction outside of the range based on what you see right here, okay? Uh, and then what, el what else is a dangerous thing that you should never do? Inferring causation. Don't do it, okay? What's inferring causation, you ask? Well, let's say, let's say that I look at a map and I notice that the areas of the highest concentration of doctors also have the highest concentration of illness. And I say, oh my God, there's a positive correlation between uh, the, the, the uh, density of doctors in an area and the density of illness in an area. Therefore, I should shoot all the doctors because that way people won't be so ill. Don't do that. That's not a good idea, okay? I leapt to a really stupid conclusion that it was the doctors making the people ill. I don't think that's probably what was going on. And I also don't think it was the illness that was creating the doctors. There's probably a lurking variable in there that is another variable on the outside that's making both of those things happen. So, do not infer causation. Now, what if you just got this data and the data doesn't look very linear. For example, here are our cars again, okay? I brought back the Toyota, the old Toyota. I got rid of the German sports cars, but I have that Toyota there because I've decided, you know, it's really not that different from the other cars. It really belongs in that same population. So uh, I'm gonna keep it. But when I look at my residuals, well, here are the residuals here, I can definitely see a pattern which tells me the linear model is probably not appropriate. I should probably have a curved model instead. That's what I would generally think, okay? Don't think that way. Don't think I need a curved model. We're not going to talk about curved models in this course. What we're going to talk about is changing this data, re-expressing the data to make it linear, okay? Now, what do I mean by re-expressing the data? I mean, instead of using x, use a log of x. Instead of, by the way, I'm using common logs. You can, lose, you can use log base anything. You can use a, a natural log if you want. You can use log base two if that makes you happy. Uh, I generally use common logs just because they're, they're common. Uh, you can use the square root of x instead of x. You can use one over x instead of x. You can use the log of y hat instead of y hat. The square root of y hat instead of y hat. You can use one over y hat instead of y hat. So now, let me show, show you what I'm talking about. Uh, oh, here's my price. What I did was, I took these dots here, and I basically let them fall to the, uh, to the y-axis, and that's the price, and then I let them fall to the x-axis, and that's the age there. So basically, I'm just looking at my univariate data, and, uh, and, and I want to see what it looks like. Well, what I see is, this looks fairly symmetrical. This does not. This is definitely skewed to the right. Well, if my data look curved, then generally one of my, one of my variables is going to be skewed in one of the directions. And if I can pull that skew in and make it more symmetric, then I will generally correct my curve. So let me show you what I mean. Uh, functions that I can use to lower the value of, uh, of my age, uh, I could use the log of the age, or I could also use the square root of the age. 
And when I look at the, the log, that looks somewhat symmetric. Square root also looks somewhat symmetric. Looks like either one of those might be pretty good. So let me try them. And uh, here's what I see. Here's the log. Uh, so now, so let me explain. I still have the price on my y-axis. Now instead of having the age, I have the log of the age. I have the logarithm of the age here. And now, as you can see, this looks way better. Okay, in my residuals plot, you might see a little bit of a pattern there, but not nearly as pronounced as we had before. Um, on the square root side, uh, again, it might be, that's, that's a little bit problematic to me, but uh, not too bad. Uh, out of these two, I would probably opt for using the logarithm instead of the square root. But if, if you ask me, either one of them is pretty good. Uh, and then you would want to ask yourself, well, what, what makes more sense? Would a, would a logarithm make more sense? Or would a square root make more sense? And actually, if I'm using the, uh, the, hmm, it's hard to say what would make more sense, but, uh, but either one of these re-expressions would definitely be an improvement over the original one that we had. Uh, here's a data set that is, uh, this is just an artificial data set. It's not anything that I found in nature. Uh, but as you can see, there is definitely a curve in this data. It should not be. Uh, modeled with a line, and then you, when you look at the residuals, it's very, very obvious that uh, something needs to be done here to fix this uh, data set. So again, if I look at my, uh, uh, just just imagine that the points just fall to the x-axis, what would that dot plot look like? It would definitely be skewed to the right, okay? Imagine if these points fall to the y-axis, what would that look like? Um, I'm not, I don't think it would be that skewed. It doesn't look like uh, it would be skewed at all. So what would I need to do? I probably want to take the log of the x's. And that's exactly what I did there. So I uh, take the log of the x's, and now this looks much, much better. Okay, You can see there's basically no pattern in these residuals at all. So what you get is you get uh, a function like this. Instead of just a linear function, you get y hat being a linear function of the log of x instead of x itself. Okay, but still, it's pretty easy to calculate. Let's look at another one. Here's a, uh, oh my god, this is just a mess, okay? Got a whole bunch of data points down here, and then they kind of scatter out here, and modeling that with a line just looks rather ridiculous. Uh, so uh, what if I just look individually at my variables? Well, my x data is very obviously skewed to the right, Okay, there's a whole bunch of it right here, and then it has a long tail going out here. And as a matter of fact, so does my y data. There's a whole bunch of this data here, and then it gets sparser as it goes out here. So that tells you that the y data, the response variable, is also skewed to the right. So what should we do? Take the logarithm of both. Here's the log of y, here's the log of x, and now when I look at it, hey, that looks pretty good. That too. Nice. Okay, no pattern in those residuals at all. I found a surprisingly good model for such crazy looking data there. All right, makes me pretty happy. Let's look at another one. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, and here's, my, uh, here's the, uh, the equation that I would get. The log of y hat equals negative 2.3 plus 0.598 times the log of x. So what does that mean? You would get your explanatory data, uh, your explanatory value, your x value, pop it in there, take the log of it, multiply it times 0.598, subtract 2.3, and then you would get a value. Then you would take 10 to that value, because that's the log of y, right? So you take 10 to that value, and that would be your estimate of y. Okay, that would be your y hat. Uh, so here's another example. Uh, now you can see this looks, uh, looks kind of like it's uh, perhaps uh, an, uh, an exponential function. Um, and again, you don't want to look at this and say, oh, let me, let me map an exponential function to it. Let me, let me fit an exponential function to it. No, 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 no. We want to change the data, OK? So this time, as I'm looking at my x variables, they don't look maybe a tiny bit skewed, but really not that skewed. My y variables, oh my god, they're extremely skewed, OK? A lot of data down here. And then there's a tail going off here to the right. So that means that uh, y is skewed to the right, so I need to compress my y's, and the best way to do that, again, take a logarithm, 
logarithms always work. Uh, so here's the log of y, here's x, and now you can see, oh my god, it's a thing of beauty. Here's, a, here's the residuals plot, absolutely no pattern at all. Now, let me, let me give you a disclaimer. Oh! Things don't always go as you expect. Uh, let me give you a disclaimer. I created these to show, to show you what it would look like. You're not going to get residuals plots that looks this beautiful. There's generally going to be some little pattern in there still, like with the cars. Uh, you, you just try to minimize the pattern, okay? You just try to make it, get rid of it as much as possible. But at some point, you're probably going to have to say, ah, it's as much as I can do. Let me go on now. And uh, maybe somebody else can find a better model, but this is as good as I can do. Okay, so uh, what do we have here? So that means we have the log of y and x, and so when we get our uh, equation, it's going to be the log of y hat equals this. So uh, again, to, to come up with my, uh, my predicted y value, I would plug in my x there, uh, multiply it times 0 0.129, add negative 1.3, that would give me the logarithm of y. That means I would then take 10 to that power to get my y hat, all right? Uh, last one we're going to look at here is, uh, now this is one that, they're just, these actually don't have exactly the same uh, y value, even though it looks like they do, uh, but there's a whole bunch of points that are just hugging the, uh, the x-axis. Basically, it looks like this is a function that has an asymptote of zero, and it, it looks like it has another asymptote of zero here, meaning this looks a lot like uh, y equals 1 over x. So therefore, I'm thinking, hey, what if I, instead of using y, what if I, well, let me stop for a second. Again, look at your x data. It's not particularly skewed one way or the other, okay? Look at your y data. Absolutely skewed. Incredibly skewed. I could use a logarithm, except this time I noticed that it really is hugging the axes here. So instead of using a logarithm, I'm going to restate y. Instead of using y, I'm going to use 1 over y. And so uh, here is my, uh, here's what happens when I do that. I get absolutely beautiful linear data. No pattern in the residuals at all. And so this is 1 over y hat equals this linear function of x. So again, what would I do if I were making a prediction? I would plug in my x value. I would figure out what that is. And then 1 over y hat would equal that. So that means I would take the reciprocal of that value to estimate what y hat is. Okay? All right. That's it for linear regression. Because next time, we start getting weird. Okay? Next video is going to be the introduction to randomness, which is our beginning of probability. It's going to be so much fun, you're barely going to be able to stand it. See you then. Thank you.